Good evening and welcome to Between the Lanes episode number 60. I'm Ron. I'm Shane. And uh, we're here to just talk about slot cars and slot car racing. And as we start off the show every week, um, you need to go find us on YouTube. The channel is Slot Racer. Um, there will now be 60 episodes up along with how-to articles and some other special episodes we've done in the last, uh, well, year and a couple months now. And um, find us on Facebook, the pages Between the Lanes. And as usual, we'll start with those race results from last weekend. A lot of racing last weekend. So the winning report will start off with the New England Retro Racing Series, NERR. They started off their 2018-19 uh, series at Bristol 1010 Raceway up in Connecticut this past weekend. And I don't have podium pictures. I've just got some pictures of the race sheets. But in the uh, Coupe class, Keith Libby was the winner. Dominic Luongo was second. Vinny Cafazzo was third. And in the Can-Am, it was Keith Libby pulling off the sweep, winning in Can-Am. With Weaver, which I believe is John Weaver, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, the second, well, you know what? According to this, I'm wrong. So it looks like, according to this, because I don't know where I got, oh, I have them backwards. Group was won by Keith Libby, Weaver was second, and Frankie Blackhorn was third. And then Can Am. Keith Libby was the winner, Dominic was second, and Vinny Cafazzo was third. So sorry about that, guys. I had my notes reversed. Um, at Port Jeff Raceway last week, they had a Northeast Nazara Series race. Um, one Motor 12 was won by Milan. Paul Kovic second, Christopher third. Pivoli 12, Milan was the winner again, Walter Berg second. Sean was third, and Two Motor International 15, Doug Bauer was the winner, Keith Keeler in second. Walter Berg in third. And the East Coast Flexi Series um, race last weekend. It was their first race of their series at Slots of Fun, Hanover, Pennsylvania, on this uh, really nice looking grandstand. And um, in the four and a half inch trucks class, Pops Davis in the center was your winner. Gary Harmon was second. Colton Harmon was third. And I don't have a picture, but in four and a half COT stock cars, Bobby Davis was the winner. Joe Weinstein, guy I raced with a long time ago, good guy, was second. And Pops Davis was third in the uh, COT race. Uh, the Gur Gator Retro Racing Region was at P1 Raceway last weekend. And um, no podium pictures again, but uh, F1 was, was won by Jeff Bonanno, Terry Tawney second, and Doc Doherty third. And it was the same podium, those three guys in stock cars. And in Can-Am, Jeff Bonanno was the winner point off the sweep. Terry Tawney second, and Marcus Ramos was third. And out in California at Buena Park Raceway, they ran hard bodies. And King Mill Conroy was the winner over Phil Nyland and Tim Herrera. Um, all I was a screenshot of the results, but I had this nice King Mill picture to put up here tonight. So, there you go, Mill. The Penn Jersey NASCAR Series was at Speed Zone in New Jersey, Mount Holly, New Jersey. They raced on the King Track. Xfinity was won by Matt Bruce. Randy Kaur second, Adam Chaya was third. And in the cup class, Randy Kaur was your winner. Tony Moore second, and Jerry Herbert Sr. was third. And Tony Moore sent me these pictures, and I, I thanked him for that. And he says, you know, I was, I was stunned I was uh, in second <laughs> place from, from the B main, but he's right. second overall from the B main. So thanks for the photos, and good job, Tony Moore. The Retro Summit BRS Series opener was at Mark's Model World this past weekend. In the Retro Angle Winder class, because we run them together, but they're split up by motor type. So in Retro Angle Winder FK, which you can run the Pro, Pro Slot uh, 4002 FK or the 4007 Scorpion motor, 
Um, Ralph Middall was the winner with Mark Keto second and Bill Fulmer third. In the big dog portion of Retro Angle Winder, um, I was the winner, Ron Hirschman. Uh, Bud Denning was second. Craig Sharpenberg was third. And the overall Retro Angle Winder podium was uh, myself, Bud Denning, and Ralph Middall. In the can, oh, in can Am, in the invitational side of things, uh, the winner was Gary Vineyard, and second was Bob Summers. And uh, Fred Oles was third, but he wasn't available for the pitcher. And in the Can Am overall, A Main, and All Stars, uh, Willie Custer was the winner. I was second. Greg Fox was third. And in the F1 Invitational, but Denning was the winner with Bob Summers second, and uh, Pops Myers was not third. I forget who was actually third now, but um, he stood in for whoever it was. And in the All Star A Main overall, um, Bud Bardos was the winner, Greg Fox second, and Dave the Shadow Smirka was third. He outproduced Al Rudy because those two is always have a thing going, who's going to beat who in the race. And gotcha. Shadow outperformed Al in F1 and can -Am. <laughs> So a week ago, they had a 80-minute hard body team enduro at T Tennessee Top Slots, Lafayette, Tennessee. And um, there's the, the cars. So our viewers know what we're talking about when we mention some of these. Sometime we're going to do a show, and we're just going to do a show on classes, and we'll put up photos Gotcha. Of and body types and trying to explain it better to people who may not understand everything we talk about. But um, uh, they ran this on the King track there. And um, when it was all said and done, this was a really close finish. Like the top team, the top eight teams were within 13 laps. But Team yeah. Roberts was the winning team with 500 laps. Team CNS was second with 498. Team Ramrod was third with 498. Team LCR was fourth with 498. And, and the Sandbagger team had 496. And the Roll Mines had 495. So the top six teams were in five laps after 80 minutes of uh, hard body uh, enduro racing. So that's, that's probably the closest uh, enduro race I've ever seen between the top six teams. So, and I'm sure it was a breakout race. And you know, it is what it is, but, you know, they, had, they definitely had a good time down there. So, um, Texas Retro Series was at Dallas Slot Cars. And in the F1 class, Ken Stevens was the winner. Gary Dean second. Alan Dotson was third. And then in Can-Am, Gary Dean was the winner. Ken Stevens was second. They kind of swapped slots there. And Rusty T was third. And in the Retro Pro class, as they call it, Casey Newbauer was your winner, Alan Dodson second, and Rusty T in third. And that's your winner winner chicken dinner reports. And we all know what that means. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. So, October is a very busy month. So, here's what we got for October. This week on October 6th. <laughs> yep. We got the Central Illinois SWAT Series um, kicking off their season at Whiskers in Broadstone, Illinois. ORS is at HMS in Bellevue, Ohio. Uh, Mid American Hard Body Nats is at Chicagoland Raceway this weekend. And the AWRA Womp Womp is at Uncle Charlie's in Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Uh, the following week in October 13, we got FNRS National Series race number. Five, I believe it is. And this one's scheduled for the now closed Tri State Motor Sports Plex. Uh, the race will be held at HMS in Bellevue, Ohio, on the recently refurbished uh, 155 foot American King track. Um, the Sano Retro Race is next weekend at Chicagoland Raceway. Penn, Ohio will be at Fast Tracks in Fremont, Ohio. And a Florida Slot Car Series will be at the Raceway Biz down in Florida. And also next weekend starts the Israel World Championships in Finland. And um, 
I think we'll probably have a special Finland show uh, the following week after the 13th. Um, uh, Justin Colvin already contacted me about setting that up and doing it. So um, cool. we'll keep you posted when it happens. October 20th, we got the uh, I think you forgot one. race, Pro Flexi Challenge race, Hobby Max, uh, Durham, Durham, North Carolina on the uh, – what do they actually call that track? I've always just called it the Engelman. Okay. Because it was yeah, known as the, <laughs> to the East at one time, but it is an Engelman type track. So Yeah. And we've got Yuska at Chicagoland Raceway, and the Ohio Challenge Cup will be at Northeast Raceway up um, Erie, Pennsylvania. And, of course, we got the Flexi Flats coming in November. Sign-ups are still open for that. November 16th and 18th, uh, Slot Car Track Concord, North Carolina. And then October 27th, we got uh, BRS at uh, HMS, along with the Hippie 100. We'll have more on that in a future show. Uh, the Northeast uh, Nazarene Nats at Port Jeff. Uh, the GER uh, will be at Fast Eddie's. NERR will be at Modelville. And Retro East will be at Race Place in New Jersey. So, new stuff. New stuff that um, they don't really talk about much, but it is that time of year where this stuff starts hitting the shelves of the distributors and the raceways. And um, there is uh, new pans for the Mazzetti Patriot Striker Defender chassis. Um, the pans, of course, interchange. Uh, but uh, in, in, in up here in the front, they're a little bit narrower now, so these pans can work on the new four and a half inch center section. Mm -hmm. And um, no more, I don't think there'll be any more black anodized pans going forward that would be replaced by uh, just regular plated and then blue anodized. And of course, I already talked about the four and a half inch chassis the new uh mazzetti defender four and a half inch chassis this is a uh, trio uh, uh ind independent pans um aluminum uh, two-piece four and a half inch with aluminum pan uh trio lightweight metal pans and uh lightweight two-piece metal pan four and a half and mazzetti also has a new gt12 chassis for you flat track racers. And from RM, or is it just RM products? Um, and Shane might be able to tell us more about this, but um, they have two new chassis a four and a half and a four inch chassis. When uh, I think this is a, this is the four inch. Yeah, that's and, the four inch chassis. Yep, and it's available with a metal and aluminum pan, correct? I believe so, yes. Okay, and then the four and a half inch chassis also has, I think, an aluminum and metal pan, correct? And an oval pan oh. where the left side where it's cut out, that's solid. Okay, cool. Hadn't seen any pictures of that yet, so. And so. Yep. that's what we got for new stuff for right now. So we actually had a couple of questions posted over on YouTube. This was from someone called The Metal. I have no idea who The Metal is. <laughs> but they asked, Ron, what do you think about Mike Swiss's modified weighted guide shoes? Not available from distributors and no standard discount to raceways. Good or bad for slots? Okay for retro? Wing? Okay, so I don't know really what I'm, I'm supposed to answer this. or, But my opinion is, I, I okay. What do I think about the modified weighted guide shoes? Well, if you're asking me from a performance standpoint or advantage, I cannot answer that because I have not tried one. Okay, so I don't know. But right. there are racers out there who say they can feel a difference with them. So until you try one and until I try one, I don't know if it makes a difference or not, good or bad. Right. But um, so they're not available from distributors. Well, 
okay, there's lots of stuff that's not available from distributors. And, you know, it's, it's you know, there's racers who offer custom built motors, there's uh, chassis, uh, bodies, tires. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of stuff out there offered that aren't available through distributors. Okay. And um, that's just the way it is. I mean, we've been beating this dead horse for 30 plus years. You know? And I mean, not everything would be available through distributors. And um, as far as no standard discounts to raceways, um, let's look at it this way. What, do, what does that guide flag sell for, Shane? I think it's 850, I believe, threaded. 850 threaded if you call Chicago Land Raceway and get one direct. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> the Red Fox guide flags, if I'm wrong, correct me, aren't they retail for like five or six bucks? I believe so. That I'm not 100% sure on. Okay, so. And I'm not really 100% sure if that's the correct price for and what I'm they not sell. sure either, but I'm, yeah. I'm thinking it's five, <laughs> five to six dollars for right. a, a, Red, a Red Fox guide flag. So, you know, by the time you put all the work into putting the weight in it, and then if you if you had to then mark that up and 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 put all your discounts in it, it'd probably be a guide flag that would be available through distributors and a standard discount. It would probably have a retail price of like sixteen dollars. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying that'd be the accurate number, but right, probably minimum fourteen. To sixteen dollars is what the retail price would be for that guide flag if it was available through distributors and raceways. So, yeah, I mean, the common thought is things everything should be available through distributors. Everything should be standard discounts to raceways. On a perfect world, yep, but we're not in a perfect world. Um, so the next question is: Is it okay for retro? Um, as far as I know, it's legal everywhere to run in retro. Um, is it okay for making your retro car perform better. I can't say, I haven't tried one, but there are retro racers. I've seen pictures of winning cars that have had them on them and right. the same with wing cars. So that's, I guess what I think and my answers and that's all I got to say. Second question came from Phil in uh, Arizona. Um, dear Ron, I'm Phil. I can't even say his last name. He, he was a customer of mine years ago um, from Tucson, Arizona. I used to race here in Tucson 25 years ago. Since then, the track closed down. But before I won Grand National Championships, I guess in 1992, I sent you my motors to fix and won Grand National Championships that year. I was so happy. I raced Womps and GTs, International 15s and 27s. I had a lot of fun. And he goes on to say that um, I always wanted to open a track. If I could, I, if I could, I would, if I could, I would, I love your program. All the tracks that you mentioned on your programs, I wish you would mention the name and addresses of the tracks and States you mentioned. I would love to race again. 55 years. I've been dreaming to race. My brother took me to a race when I was two years old, Filbert. So someone had sent him a link I posted a link to his post on YouTube to Slot Blog, which has the right. The yeah, they got the list, right? And um, just in case Phil didn't see that, or you know, he's watching the show, but but there's a link there, Phil, if you didn't um, find it already. But there is a raceway in Mesa, Arizona, called Speed Sport Hobbies. They have a 105 foot road course and a drag strip. And other than that, that's the only commercial raceway I know of, and in Arizona. So I don't know how far right. Tucson is from Mesa. I didn't look that up. But, uh, if you do decide to open a raceway field, good luck. And maybe we can get out there someday and race at your track. And there's a picture of the flat track um, there in Mesa, Arizona at Speed Sport Hobbies. That's a pretty cool looking little road course. Yeah, I like um, it. Now that I'm kind of acquired <laughs> into flat tracking now. So yeah, it's now it's only six lanes, but you know, six lanes can give you as much fun as eight. So, oh yeah. Guess what? We're going back in time. Yeah, a little bit. 
Before I was born or after? <laughs> um, a little bit of both. All right. A little bit of both. So um question recently was raised um, elsewhere online. What was the release date of the Flexi, Parma Flexi car chassis and I guess ready to run car? So I had to go to the vault. <laughs> I was I, I I was right in my mind, but I didn't remember kind of all the details and right. So this is a this is a picture of the front page of a Parma price list, not a catalog, but price list that they would put in the catalogs. But and this is the July nineteen eighty four to January nineteen eighty five. So effective July eighty four. So that means that these price sheets went out to the distributor sometime in June of 84. Mm -hmm. And then they would have been distributed to raceways prior to that. And um, in Parma's um, price list, they would put a star or maybe it's a dot. What is it? It's a dot. Red <laughs> dot next to new items that were new in this price list from the previous price list. So, I took a close-up shot and I didn't get the blue dot, but um, where it says 132nd super scale super womp, above it there's the outlaw firebird, which I don't know what that might have been a womp womp, but there's a blue dot there. So that designated there's that's a new product. So you come down 124 scale cars, and the first two lines are is 426A flexi car ASA Camaro with flexi hinge chassis. And 426B flexi car v, vet GTP with flexi hinge chassis, twenty three dollars. Which you can't see because the way I took the picture is the blue dots next to that. But <laughs> new for January of eighty four, or Parma was now telling the world that we have this new flexi car. Okay, so mm -hmm. the August nineteen eighty four issue of Scale Auto Racing News had a picture of the flexi car on the front cover with the body off down here at the bottom. And over in the right, it said coming next month, flexi car report. So now back then, like in this August issue, it had race reports from like June of 84. So two things, we don't know when the August 84 issue actually got to raceways and distributors like did it get there on August 1st did it get there in July or did it get there in September because the magazines were never really on time if if you know what I mean so and then inside that August 84 issue it said about the cover Parma's new flexi car look for a complete report next month on the back page back cover I will show you here I have it is the ad for the Parma the flexi car from Parma the all new high tech 124 scale racer and as we see here due August 1st so Parma's release date are to have them into distributors would have been or their target date would have been August 1st so the September 84 issue comes out. It obviously came out after the USRA Nats was over, which was the first weekend of September back then, Labor Day weekend. Um, I don't know if this came out a week after the Nats, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Maybe it came out in October. Don't know. But uh, we have here Flexi Car Review on the front cover. And down here is the new Parma baby brass car and inside the magazine there is a review uh, by John Ford who you know owned published wrote scale Auto racing news for many years hats off to John for keeping us well informed back in the dark times of slot car racing and um, the article kind of starts off with uh, Ken McDowell and crew have really been working overtime to bring us some new items in time for Christmas this year. This report is about one of those items, the flexi car. About 30 days before its announced release, so 
John apparently got this car sometime around the 1st of July because that was 30 days prior to the August 1st release date. Um, Ken sent me one to analyze and you know, just goes on. Um, he thought it looked flimsy, um, but he said he couldn't have been more wrong. It's a tough little car. More important, it works right out of the box. It beats everything in its price range, hands down, which that time, anything in that price range was a womp womp. I mean, <laughs> the flexi car was a revolutionary thing, but it didn't really take off at first because everyone was just so into womps or into like, you would go up to brass cars and things that were soldered together, you know, brass and wire and stuff. And this was kind of in the middle. And um, so, you know, he does the review. And then in November of 84, the slot shop in Illyria, Ohio, had their 20th anniversary race. And it was held on November 6, 1984. And um, they had decided to go with the new flexi car. And they had 88 entrants, which 88 entrants people came to celebrate the slot shop's 20th anniversary, old, new, um, in between racers. And uh, everybody had to race the, the flight. They, you know, they took them out of the boxes. They let guys uh, kind of practice with them for about 15 minutes, according to the article. And they had Parma 4 ohm controllers on all the lanes. And uh, they, they set the races by skill level. And uh, there's some more on that story. The heats were set up by skill. Entrants were given 15 minutes to practice. They lined up for eight three minute heats. So, at the end, uh, Bud Bardos from Parma was the winner. Huh. Long time slot shop uh, racer, and you know he he lived in Illyria for many years, and that was kind of a Parma test track back in the day. Mark Bacconi <laughs> was second, and then we had the late Paul Hubble here on the left, and Donna Hubble with the with the family dog on the right, and that was back. Uh, November 6, 1984, so, and the race was a success, and, you know, the flexi car was kind of off after that. So, now this is before your birthday, <laughs> before you were born. Um, talk a little bit about Lancer bodies. Um, in a future episode, I'll be doing a pretty in-depth um, kind of body history and um, it's kind of funny and it's kind of unique how Lancer, Kirby, Mac associated out of sight, Parma, all these body companies were intertwined and uh, by certain individuals along the way and um, is what it is. But Lancer was the big body company of the 60s. I mean, there was no bigger body company than Lancer. And, you know, Lancer went through a lot of changes over the years from the time they started in 1963 and till the time they basically quit making slot car bodies in probably about 1977. Uh, a lot of stories out there about, you know, Lancer closed in 1969 and we will debunk that in future, in a future episode with a very in-depth with lots of uh, lots of proof of things when they happened and when they didn't happen. So, Lancer was really known for detail and quality in their in their bodies. And you know, the, this topic again uh, brought up earlier this week. And um, you know, a lot of people think there was all these secret processes in the molds and stuff. And there really wasn't any secret processes. It was just smart people doing right things to get that detail. And, you know, on the Lancer, a lot of the Lancer molds, anywhere that there's like a screen, the actual production mold has screen inlaid into the, you know, like they would mill or cut a pocket, right. lay the screen in, epoxy it in place, and that would give that appearance of a screen in the Lexan body. And, you know, this is um, like the motor area of a Can-Am car behind the driver. 
And um, like the real car, there was screen there over the uh, trumpets or the carburetors. And, you know, again, they put screen there. And they would put little brass pieces and parts here and there on the mold to give that right. detail of the real part on the, on the car or the body. And, you know, this is uh, one where these are like actually um, Zeus fasteners. These, um, these are, to me, these are almost like they are um, push pins and they, they cut the heads into a diamond. Right. Um, probably drill the hole. Right. Push the pin in. You know, put some epoxy on there, push the pin in and cured it. And you've got the appearance of Zeus fasteners on the, on the body like they were on the real car. And, you know, Lancer would send people to real races. They, a lot of times they would send photographers to Riverside when the Can-Am races were there. Maybe someone was there testing and get all these close-up pictures and then come back and replicate all that detail into the molds, which would then be put into the bodies. Um, this is the back end of a body where, again, we got some Zeus fasteners. We got some tailpipes which is kind of like brass tubing. You know, they've drilled in, put in brass tubing, epoxied around it so it wouldn't fall out, and again, put some screen back there like the real car had. So, and then <clears throat> Lancer, you know, like they had multiple molds. Okay, I use the word multiple. There was multiple piece molds. Mm -hmm. There was anywhere from single mold, single piece molds, double piece molds, three-piece molds, and four-piece molds. Not very many four-piece molds, but there was a couple. They had multiple molds. So like this is mold number 155, and this is number two mold of number 155. Now, there's one and there's two. There could be three, there could be four. There could be six. I can tell you that, um, we're going to this, further detail. One, one of the stories that's been told, there was only four Batman molds, or Batmobile molds made by Lancer for production tools. Um, there happens to be 10 that I know of, because I have four in my shop right now, and there's another six at REH Distributing who bought and owns Lancer to this day. So there, there are at least 10 Batmobile production molds, contrary to all loom, rumors and other stories out there, right. there's, there's at least 10. And um, so that's, that's what I'm gonna leave Lance Rap for now. So um, when I was at Mark's Model World, because we talked about the Parma packaging mm -hmm. a couple weeks back on the show, and Mark um, also had the Parma box in question, was this a real deal or not? But again, this is how Parma packaged the ready to run cars back in the probably mid to late seventies, maybe into the early eighties, because I like, again, my local raceway, which opened in November of 81, every now and then we would get in 124th cars that would still be in these boxes. But eventually they went to the boxes that we all know uh, today. So, this is another Parma ready to run. On, on the end of the box, on, on the lid on the end, was the description. This was a group 20, this box was for a group 20 unlimited with a, with a Mira new breed motor and 30, 30 second drill blank axles, front and rear, in this, this uh, Lola 290 ready to run car, okay? so. While the box is original and the car is original, it's not the right car for the box. This is a Group 12 sliding plumber, um, ready to run car. Um, it's got the two hole mirror can. The new breed mirror can was the four hole can, the Trinity hole pattern. Um, and uh, this car of course has eighth inch axles and um, 48 pitch gears. Um, I believe the front axles in these cars were, I think they were 330. Well, I think they were eighth inch in these cars as well as the rear. Where the group 20 cars and the group 22 cars at Parma made 
they had 332nd front and rear, and they had 64 pitch gears on them. And I, it seems to me that some of the gears they used for a while were eighth inch hub gears that they would sleeve to fit the 332nd axles. Because I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but because it's been so long ago, and I haven't seen one forever, I almost right. think Group 20 cars had it. Well, they had a 332nd according to that. Because I remember there was there was one Group 20 car that Parma made that actually had an eighth inch rear axle and in the nylon 48 pitch tooth gears. Then the Group 22 car had a 332nd axles and also had uh, 64 pitch gears. So um, I guess I should have bought one and saved one a zillion years ago. And right. We had it here to show, but yeah. When I was in Chicago, Roger had a bunch of old chassis I was looking at. Yeah, and it just they just looked neat how they were built back then. Yep. So you know, we also talked about you know old Womp cars with the big fat fronts on them, and <laughs> Mark had a couple of those, and and um, these are both ones a Brabham F1 on the left, and this other one I think is the March Indy car, and uh, this they actually. Um, have the old Johnson 222 16D motor and um, the, the blue and white packaging, which the, the previous car I showed you went to this type of packaging in the early 80s, but they were longer boxes. They also used that longer box for controllers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Parma 132nd scale RTR, $10.50. <laughs> And uh, like I said, these are late 70s, early 80s uh, WAMPs. Um, the one on the right, which you can't see, would be a newer one than this one because it had 12 different WAMP models based by body style. So there's some more old Parma. And then here's some old Parma controller packaging. Um, when I bought my Econo controller at my local raceway i paid ten dollars for it so that was 1981 so these are probably late 70s controllers and the sparkle gold handle that was like the trademark handle at the time here's um, a good question do those triggers ever get hot because they oh, have metal triggers oh there. yeah <laughs> oh yeah i just looked at that and i was like that trigger looks like it's metal yeah, that's the old that's that's all original rust kit tooling from uh, the 60s and yes those triggers will get very hot <laughs> and Back before they made the turbo controller and the nylon trigger for the turbo controller, mm -hmm. you know how you can go out and buy that, you can buy a can of stuff you can dip tools in, that put rubberized yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. A lot of racers would dip their dip the triggers in that, put tape on them, or maybe put tape on the trigger and tape on their finger. Right. Um, because when you would run open cars, these would get extremely hot extremely hot and those were always good for short the track out when guys would lay their controllers down and the trigger would yeah. on the post and throw sparks so um and then there's the, there's the end flap on the uh early parma packaging so eight dollars so like you know you know 1981 i walked in the raceway for 20 bucks i had a controller in a car yeah that's how i got started racing so, and the funny thing was, our, our track actually rate like if retail was ten dollars, they just added two dollars to cars and controllers, and we paid more. And then it was a big blow up one night when someone got a Parma price sheet mailed to them. <laughs> they found that the raceway was charging more than retail, right? <laughs> on everything, boy, did it get ugly that night at the raceway. So. Because I think whenever I got started, my car was fifty dollars flexi two four and a half inch, right? And then we had the Parma controllers, and I think they were like forty five. Well, okay, so when when I started, the Parma Turbo was twenty three bucks, and I thought was that was, I thought that was a fortune, like yeah, because I had the wet round resistor with the little screw and heat sinks and oh, yeah. everything. Yeah, you had you had the Deluxe Turbo. Yep, wet wound resistor. Yeah, that was a sixty dollar deal. I think we called those pro turbos. Yeah, I don't even remember. 
They had a I'll heat probably still have it somewhere around here. Should have, had a, should have had a string hanging out of it so you could hang yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 It had the purple wire. Yep. Yeah, purple wire. Yep. 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 That was a pro. I think we called those pro turbos. Gotcha. And those were, I remember, well, when we, when we came out with them, I was at Parma, we came out with them, I think those retailed for $60. Because at that mm -hmm. time, I think the turbos were retailing for 42 or 43 Right. But the better wire and the heat sink and the wet wound resistor just oh, add yeah. more to retail. So we also we have some we have a giveaway tonight when I said something about new products. So JPM Performance um, has some new motor screws out. Um, these are chassis to motor screws. Uh, they're a metric screw. Um, so we're going to give away two packages of the new JPM Performance metric motor screws. A little bit later here in the show. And that's what I got. So, do you have any questions over this history stuff? No, oh, I'm just soaking it all in. It's just cool whenever you start coming across the stuff that I can kind of relate to. Well, see, one well, other thing about the release date of the Plexi was, you know, Someone brought up the thing about uh, the patent date because Parma Flexi car was granted a patent. Um, it was filed on July 3rd, 1985, which was right before it was released. And, um, well, no, I take that back. It was, well, it was, okay. So by patent law, um, once you put something on the market, you have, to, you have to file a patent. If you want to put a patent, you have to file on it basically one year no more than one year after it went on sale. So it came out on October 1st of 84. They filed for a patent on July 3rd of 1985. So they were about a month early of the expiration on that. So they filed on July 3rd, 1985. The patent was granted on October 7th, 1986. And what is patented on a flexi car is the flexi hinge. And the flexi hinge is the front axle going through the pan center section and holding the chassis together. Right. That, is, that is the unique thing that got the chassis patented. Now, at one time, the belief was, if anyone makes a two-piece chassis, even if it doesn't have the flexi hinge, but it has a bent-up motor bracket and bent-up pillow blocks, and that's, that's a violation of our patent. And it was, right. not, it was, it was uh, not tested in court, but the patent attorney said, no, those cars are not in violation of the patent. The flexi hinge is what the patent is about. Now, as I said on a show before, um, Racer Products came out with a flexi car shortly after the Parma flexi car, and it had a flexi hinge. They, they held the two pieces together with the front axle and they had a cease and desist immediately, which they did. <laughs> and they went to hold in their two pieces together with pop rivets. So, and that was a spider chassis. Yeah, I remember the spider chassis. And I'm still gathering bits and pieces to do a pretty in-depth history of the, of the flexi chassis cars group 10 over the years so because yeah, the one picture that was a flexi one wasn't it yeah flexi well see it was called flexi car was it and then when flexi two came out they just referred right. to the flexi car as flexi one they won okay right yeah, so whatever i got into it it was flexi two but there were still people with flexi one cars right and then whenever i actually started traveling with the mid-south series eddie beard you mentioned him before he had a flexi one right that he used to race gtp with because he said they were so light right now see when we when okay so like you know parma said the the release date was going to be august 1st i recall the cars not being at the distributors on august 1st there was some kind of production problem or something because i don't think they hit the distributors until mid september and um, I can remember we kept asking about them because you've seen that, you know, the ad. 
right. the raceway owner. Well, they don't have them yet. They don't have them yet. And, you know, again, maybe there wasn't a production problem. Maybe there was a supply problem early on. Mm-hmm. And, and, and distributors were saying there's a production problem to the raceways that couldn't get them. And, um, yeah, I remember our raceway. I think they got six in. And like I said, middle of September. And um, it was probably, I want to say six months before we started racing them. Because it was just like, it was just a womp world. I mean, there was really no interest right right off the bat. A lot of new raceways opened, and they started off with flexi cars. But the existing raceways were all kind of womp based. Right. Yeah, because the raceway that opened here in Charleston when they were open I think they opened around early 90s you'd walk into the front door they had their showcases and that's what they had was the four four inch and four and a half inch cars yeah they've been all flexi cars yeah yep flexi a four and a half with a brass extender on it do you remember no, this one was a uh, they had the Parma flexi 2 not 1990 they didn't no, what did they have? Because like I remember the car that I had was the Flexi Two, the Palmer Flexi Two. Flexi Twos, Flexi Twos came out in '94. So that must have been whenever the track opened was right, because that's what was in the package. Yeah, Flexi Twos came out in 1994. Okay, yeah, because they had the square bushings and all that. Yep, and there was a four and, and a half inch version. Yep, and then the four inch version, because that's what I start. That's the two that I bought and start racing with. Right, because see, prior to that, and I'll have to dig one out. And again, when we do the flexi thing, right. but, yeah. But but the Parma flexi car was four inch, mm-hmm. and there was a guy in Kentucky. Well, there was a Raceway in Kentucky. They were running four and a half inch flexi cars, and one of the local racers was building what they called an extender, and it was a right. flat, I remember the extender. flat piece of brass with a round piece solder to it, mm-hmm. and a little piano wire thing that kept it from flopping too much or something. Right. And and they were racing those, and then. Uh, Ken McDowell reached a deal with that guy to where Parma made them and then they paid him a royalty on every one that was sold. Right. And, and, the, and then Parma had sold the extender and then, then finally we started producing a four and a half inch car with the extender. Did they have another extender also that was a piece of, like that a was, piece of plate? That was the Flexi Hot Wing. Was it that kind of screwed in and then you could solder or whatnot but you had to cut well, the front wings off? No, the Flexi Wing... Um, again, <clears throat> I'll have to dig one out, but right. what you do is you take your front axle out mm-hmm. and that would lay down and it, the, the fold up on it was between the, between the uprights. So when you put the axle in, you went through the pan, through the center, through the hot wing, through the hot wing, through the center section, through the pan out the other side of the car. Gotcha. And, and that put wings out in front of the flexi chassis. Mm-hmm. So that was called the flexi hot wing sold a zillion of them um right. it was a cool little piece but i mean it, right. but you, you could put that in your car and it, and it made a big difference i mean right when, when it was when it was a flexi world and parma was parma flexi car was the only car mm-hmm. that's all you raced right then, like when the jk cheetah came out i was like it's now it's a whole new world because oh yeah yeah because i remember that car was better than a flexi car because it had more weight out front. And then the champion Astro XC came out mm-hmm. and, you know, it had front wings on it. So, you know, we wanted to make a new chassis and we did right. with the flexi two, but in the meantime, we needed something to make the flexi car a little more universal. So we came up with a hot wing and, um, yeah, it was a cheap four. I think it was four dollars and fifty cent piece. Yeah, because it came in a small little pack. Right, and then and then Flexi Two came out, and that was the first Parma four and a half inch dedicated chassis. Because mm-hmm. prior to that, the first four and a half inch chassis was the one piece JK Scorpion. Or right. yeah, I guess the first one was. Did JK make a one piece four and a half? JK made a one piece four and a half, but it wasn't called a Scorpion. Then there, he made. No way, I don't remember what they called that chassis. But then they came out with a one piece four and a half inch Scorpion, and mm-hmm. then the two piece. Right. They had the little pivot. Right. And you and can make also, it a little bit shorter long. 
Right, and they also had one piece four inch scorpion and a two piece four inch scorpion. Right, and then before that they had just a regular pan cars, didn't they? The four and a half inch pan cars. Who? JK. Well, his first two four and a half inch cars were one piece cars. Right. And then he went to two piece. And then. Um, yeah, because he had some that were heat treated and unheat treated, and some of them the front was kind of bent. Yeah, yeah. And all. And then I think. Yeah, there were uh, some. The one piece some... scorpions were soft. And because they were one piece, they would, they would bend or tweak real easy. Right. So he tried having them heat treated. And the two problems with heat treat was yeah, they would warp like hell. Right. They'd be flat. Or they'd be so hard that if you went to bend like a upright, it it's just snapped off. Right. Yeah, it just crystallized the metal. So, and then, you know, Champion came out with the Turbo Flex, and you had the Slotworks chassis. Mm-hmm. Um, you had the Gambler chassis. Uh, and Gambler before, chassis, that was an odd one. Before JK, you had, like I said, the Racer Product Spider Cars chassis. The and Spiders, so that was the those are the ones, that was, what would, Trinity came out with the forward and four and a half inch chassis too, didn't they? Yeah, they did, the, the Spider. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, but that was in, that was like in the early to mid 90s. Like, right, because I remember when those came out. 93. Right. And then we had a guy at our local raceway. He bought a four and a half inch spider chassis. And it was funny because no one ever ran them because they said they could never get them to handle. Right. And you know how you buy lead weight, just the square pieces of lead weight? He right. literally bought a piece of a square lead weight and stuck it right in the middle. The whole piece of lead, he set track record, fast time, and everything. Well, those cars were so, those cars were so heavy to begin with, but, um, And then, and then you had the, like the race pace chassis that was in there too. And again, I'm slowly getting everything together. Right. There, were, there were some chassis. There was Euro toys, but like going back to it was a flexi car world. Mm-hmm. When flexi car came out in '84, I never seen a racer product spider car, and they'd had them out for a year or two. Right. The 87 Nats in Chicago. But our raceway never ordered any race. None of the raceways that I went to in that time traveled to, and no one had. It was always it was all Parma Flexi cars. Right. So, because I mean, our raceway went basically after a while. Once the Flexi car caught on, mm-hmm. wants to become non-existent. We raced Flexi cars. With 16D motors, and we raced Parma brass cars with Group 12 motors in them and and full air control wing car bodies, and we raced box stock 15 cars. That was our our weekly class of program. Right. And um, you know, we go to Tri-State USRA races, and we raced flexi cars, and we raced um, the brass cars without air control, and we raced box stocks, and then. Um, another class that was kind of popular for a short time was the Womp Womps with the extenders, which you'd take the, the body clips out and you would put these, these Z bent extenders <laughs> on with right. it, and you would put these, uh, piano wire kind of U clips in there and bend them. So the, the extenders would stay on the chassis and your clips would go but the bodies were like three and a quarter inches wide. So it made your womp womp super wide, more down, right. um, you know, widen your front and rear track out. Right. And uh, we ran those at the local track for a short time. And uh, Tri-State USRA, we ran, what we called it pro womps. And we ran, because the womps went, I mean, like, womps went dead. And then it was kind of like, well, let's try running pro womps, because some of the raceways ran them. Right. And and so for a year or so, the Tri State USRA ran Pro Womps flexi cars and brass cars with no air control and group twelve motors in. So that was like the entry level type classes. 
because I think the closest we ever came to running like Womp style cars was when the Legends cars came out. The Champion Legends car. Champion Legends car. Yeah, they had the little Legends car bodies on them. Oh yeah, yeah, they yeah. They may yeah. have been out beforehand, but the like, we never. Yeah, and yeah, they the came thumpers. out. Yeah. Because like our raceway, one week it was what they called like NASCAR week. It was four inch NASCAR, four and a half inch NASCAR, Nash truck, and then they would run the Legends class. Okay. And then the following week after that, it was like GTP week. You would run 16D GTP, Super 16D GTP, and that was really it. They tried starting a, a like a Group 12 class, but that never really took off. Right. Okay, so last last week we were talking about um, um, womps and wintergreen oil on tires and mm -hmm. licking the silicone tires because the silicone yeah, yeah. worked on the on the base that the wintergreen and rubber. Okay, so I because <laughs> I start, started to tell you this and we went off on. But anyway, so <laughs> we do that never okay, happened. So so back then. <laughs> Parma made these little modified bodies for the womp ups. There was a Gremlin and a Pinto. And then Rhino was another body company, and they made right. an offset Mustang, I believe is what it was. So <clears throat> we decided to have a modified race. And, and we raced on an 80 or yeah, an 80 foot Windsor track, American Yellow. And um we would have these special races, kind of like your NASCAR week. And so right. we have this modified race. And so on the day of the modified race, we went and raced the real race car down at Winchester and brought it home in a, in a, in a box of parts. But um, um, so I actually at that time was managing the store that we were going to have the race at. And I told the guy that managed the North store who was going to come out and open that store. Cause we weren't going to get back from Winchester until like five or six o'clock, about an hour before the race was going to start at um, seven o'clock because it was a Monday night. I think it was like July 3rd and, and it was a special, it was an ARCA race at Winchester is what it was. Right. And so it's like, you know, go open the raceway at two, clean the track, and and uh, you know get all the rubber and the wintergreen off of it because I think part of that we had never cleaned the track but we wanted the track to be a little slippery. Right. Okay? So I tell Byron go out there clean the track. So back then no cell phones or nothing. But anyway, so we get right. back yeah. down. I I go straight to the track. I put my car on. I mean it's just it just spins the tires and it's just like go sideways in the slots and it, it just won't go. Right. And I'm like, he goes, track's real clean, huh? Ha ha ha. And he's like, yeah, what'd you do to it? And he goes, well, I lacquer thinnered it all down and then I lemon pledged it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. So normally we would run like four seconds, I think, lap time. I think we were lucky to run nine seconds. Right. With the track lemon pledged. And I always tell people, don't ever lemon pledge a track. But it took about 12 weeks for the track to ever come back. Right. To where it was. Where it was. Because we didn't allow glue on it. And we, were, and we really didn't know what. And back then, no one knew what spray glue was. Right. You, know, you would read about spray glue in rule books. And you're like, what's spray glue? Yeah. And no one ever could say, well, you take a bottle of glue and naphtha and mix it and yeah. The track, you know, it was like, what is spray glue? But back then, everybody put zones on the track and you put dots. Right. And eventually, you know, six months after that, we, we uh, decided to start allowing them to run glue. So, you know, we'd run our womps in glue and, <laughs> and uh, we ran everything in glue. It was a lot of fun. But, um, yeah, it made a big difference. But uh, no more wintergreen and no more wintergreen headaches. Yeah, because there's some places you can walk by guys and you can tell if they're treating their tires because it's oh, just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, back then you'd walk in the raceway and it just it just smelled smell like wintergreen. Wintergreen, yeah, and because you had carpeting, people would spill it, and you know what's like, another funny smell you could pick up a mile away. 
did you race uh did you race rc cars or you were around rc cars weren't you well, yeah i've been yeah shugu yep well okay <laughs> shugu yeah it's like um, i could smell that stuff and it's just like whoa <laughs> yes. when, I, when i when i went to work at parma you know in the r&d department was you know slot car guys and rc guys in the same room area right and uh, we all had desks and rc guys were over there and slot guys were over here and and um I remember I went to a race and I had problems sucking my body in the rear. And um, Patrick Barber said something like, why don't you put Shugo on your body? And Shugo, what's Shugo? <laughs> and then he explained it and I kind of like, oh yeah, I remember using that one time a zillion years ago on a pair of shoes, you know, like fixed pair of shoes. Right. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, he says, you know, he showed me his RC body. He was, he, what, they, what they were doing is where they punch the holes or drill the holes for the body mounts. Mm -hmm. Right. Put it around there because they would be prone to cracking from yep. vibrating. And they put some up in the wheel wells where they might crack when they, you know, crash into a then wall. Then they had the big bumper on the front. Some guys would put it there, yeah. too, to help with that. Yep. So I was like, okay. So I, I would shoe goo my bodies. And and that that's that's a tech tip. Um, right. Oh, yeah. I mean, I got it in my box. Yep. I've got yeah. – well, I don't have shoe goo. I have E5000. Yeah, um, yeah. It's the same thing. It smells the, the same. <laughs> the difference between Shugu and E5000 is Shugu is more thicker. I use Shugu, Shugu for a long time. Right. And then Mill Conroy actually told me about the E5000, how it's so thin you can kind of brush it. But I would take Shugu and put it on my finger and just rub it up into the... So here's another tech tip. You know, like, you know, here's your, here's your front fender and here's your hood. Yeah. You know, you know press it up in there with my finger, the mm -hmm. Shugu. Right. But then I tried E5000. It's like, oh, yeah, this is this is like, one is like, sugar is like taking toothpaste or plaster and trying right. to put it in things. And E5000 is like water paint. I mean, that stuff is all over. So, you know Guy Spalding, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, Guy Spalding, I was talking to him about it. And he said, if you lick your finger, you could spread that stuff and it won't stick to your finger. And I came mm -hmm. home, grabbed an old body, and put some shoe goo in it. Because I was always just like trying to wick it in there or whatnot, be right. careful. And he's like, no, no, just lick your finger. I licked my finger and got it in there. Didn't stick to my finger. Nothing did exactly what I wanted to, to do. And I was like, oh, all right. I'd always so, spread it in there and then go wash my – I mean, it, it, you'd have to really work to get it off your fingers. Right. But Make I little boogers and flick them. <laughs> if you're going to shoe goo. Yeah, just lick your finger. Lick your finger, put it, dip it in water and do it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the only thing I can tell you about E5000 and Shugu is you really want to use it in a ventilated area. Because oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my, my neighbor, um, he used a lot of E5000, and he did, he did, him and his wife had a craft school, and so they used tons of E5000. And he right. actually had kidney failure huh. that the doctors felt was due to the E5000. And I mean, if you read the back of the tube, I think it even warns about it can cause cancer and stuff. So gotcha. you know, using that stuff, use it in a well-ventilated area. I mean, for what little bit I ever use it, I never worried about it. But right. I, don't, I don't think you really have to worry about it. But I just want to put that precaution out there. Oh, yeah. That, um, yeah, it can be some nasty stuff. I mean, somebody told me they, they did a bunch of shoe gluing one time and got super dizzy and – Kind of oh I, yeah, I have. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. That could that might explain some things about me, but yeah, that's why I would, as soon as you said ventilated, I was like, "Yep." Okay. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. But you can do an E five thousand in any checkout aisle at Walmart. Walmart, Hobby <laughs> Lobby, Michaels. Yeah. Any any the dollar store, Family Dollar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All them. Yeah, and um, yeah, Walmart has it usually like in every checkout aisle. And if you can't find it there, it'll be in the craft section. Or in the, or by the shoes. Yeah, I always just found it in the crafts. I never looked for yeah. it in the shoe Oh, yeah, they got, they got it in the shoe. Yep. So, so. yeah, it's, it's great stuff for for reinforcing your body. I mean, it's, it's lightweight. I mean, unless you put it on real thick. But you just right. put it on real thin, and it and it really keeps the bodies from cracking and splitting. If you, if you um, I use some in Chicago on my rear wing because the body split. Oh, 
Yeah, for repair. I'm like putting body armor and like rubbing shoe glue in it real quick. And I'm like, I got this crap all over me. That's whenever I was like, can I change bodies? And y'all were like, oh, I'm like, all right. <laughs> yeah, for repair. Yeah, I never thought about that. Yeah, because I mean, it, it dries so fast. I mean, it's not super fast, but I mean, the outer layer gets dried enough right. to worry about it. Yeah. So. Yeah, because I was doing the front of my retro bodies for a while with uh, either product doing because retro bodies you got to cut the front wheel wells out so you got a mm -hmm. cracking problem you know like up in the Go center around. of the arc right like, top of the fender so i put some up in there and hey, when i first found out about it was rc racing and we would race a uh, nas truck and the nas trucks had the wing and i was like well how do you get the wings on there and some guys were like they made like plastic rivets Mm -hmm. And then other guys were like, well, you know, we put four plastic rivets and run some shoe goo. And I was, I was a kid. So I'm like, well, what's shoe goo? Right. And that's when they told me. And I was like, oh, all right. And then I totally forgot about it and got back into racing. And I don't even remember where I was, but I was like, you know, this would be perfect if I had some shoe goo. And that's kind of when I went on a shoe goo hunt and found it at Walmart. I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, shoe goo has a thousand uses. I've only, but I only, I've only used it for reinforcing my, I mean, I remember. I mean, shoe has been around since I was a kid. And right. Probably, it's probably something that's been around since the 40s or 30s, but I can remember my dad trying to fix a pair of shoes of mine with it <laughs> or something. I mean, I that's a pair of flip-flops. <laughs> for a while, but, yeah. you know, it wasn't a permanent fix, so. Um, I had a pair of flip-flops that were splitting. I was just like. But probably from the go. time I was five until the time I was 26 or 27 i never seen or had or smelled shoe goo yeah and then like you said a very unique smell yeah so there you go that's it that's a that's a freebie tech tip freebie tech tip we got any more now we need to buy we need to go buy stock and shoe goo <laughs> yeah it's gonna suit up <laughs> it's funny well, i'm surprised that someone hasn't actually like repackaged it and sold it as a slot car product. Right. Oh, well, we just gave that away. We could be giving it away on the show. So, all right, let's give away some screws from JPM Performance. The winners need to contact JP Milcherska on Facebook. Are you JPM Performance Facebook page? So, winner number one. Kevin Owens is the winner. I know that name, but I and but I don't know where he's from. Yeah. Winner number two. Yeah, he'll use those. Paul Kovich, wing car racer. <laughs> but you know he can give them to a local racer that would oh, yeah. them in a retro car there at Port Jeff and. Might turn into some sales for Port Jeff and JPM. And yeah, they run, they run retro cars there. Yeah, and they run. Um, I say they don't run hard bodies. So, so Kevin Owens and Paul Kovich get a hold of JP Melcherska, JPM Performance, for your bag of motor screws. So, anything else? Not that I can think of. I was just thinking when you were going through race dates, did you mention Mid South had a race? No, I didn't. And you know what? I've got to get my calendar, my main calendar. Right. To date. I don't even know what I did with my notes here, but you know what? I think they're right here. No. I was thinking if anyone was wanting to come down, up, or over, that's the week before the big money race. Oh, yes, I could use that as a warm up. Mm -hmm. Here. Get it. So let me add that so we can announce that on next week's show. <laughs> so Mid South, October 13th. October 13th. Hobby, Durham. Max. Hobby Max. I always call it Durham. And back to. Um, back to. Um, you know, the mention that we should mention addresses and stuff of raceways. 
Um, mm -hmm. We I always try and mention the state or the city and state, but when we mention raceways, almost every one of these raceways I mention has Facebook pages. Okay. So if you're on Facebook, you can look those raceways up and like their pages and probably get updates in your news feeds when they make posts and stuff and all that kinds of stuff. So race schedules and everything else. Yep. Yep. So you're going to mid South race, right? You, yep. might well, you might as well just pitch a tent there. Where's that? Oh, and Hobby Mac. Hobby Mac. Uh, I'll be, be the eleventh. I'll be testing at the for, at the flat tracks at Randy's, and then that Friday we're going to watch NHRA qualifying. Four wide. Four wide. Yep. Have you ever watched uh, NHRA qualifying? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've watched it, and I've you, been to. You've been to it a lot. This is my first NHRA. I've been to IHRA, and I've seen. So I've you. Seen I've seen some fast stuff, but I've never been to a full funny okay, car. So Bobby's all like, okay. Bobby's like, yeah, you're in for it. And I was like, all right. Well, I, can. I mean, nitro cars are nitro cars. I mean, the, the yeah, feeling. Yeah, I've seen nitro cars. Yeah, there's no feeling or experience like it in the world. I mean. Yeah, and then we get, I think the ticket's also a pit pass, so we get to walk around. Right. So. Just look on my Facebook page when I'm there, because if they're, Warming one up, I'll, I'll go you'll live. There, you'll be there filming it? Yeah, I'll be there crying. Okay. So. Well, that's all I got for this week. That's all and, I got. Um, um, you racing um, this weekend? Um, undecided yet. I'm taking want, the weekend off. <laughs> I, want, I want to, I want to, I want to, I got, but I got stuff I need to kind of get done and uh, – but I'm gonna I'm gonna try and sneak out. We'll see. Gotcha. I'm I'm off. I'm going to relax and do some stuff around the house and maybe go get a good dinner somewhere. We can do that on Sunday when you get back from the races. Uh, Sunday I get back from race and I go to sleep. <laughs> I no sooner get the truck park unloaded, it's like taking a nap. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for watching episode 60. We will be back next week, probably on Wednesday, as usual. Some, sometimes we have to skip it. Or My work schedule, yeah. On schedule, but um, yeah. next Wednesday, 8 o'clock, episode 61, what will they talk about? Hey, what's the secret word for the show? Products. Products? Yep. Products. New products coming out. So new products, yeah. new products or products will work. That's the time of year, and it's getting close to Christmas too. There you go. So, yeah. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. <laughs>